It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 470, Interview with Michel Paradis, who comes on to discuss his book, The Light of Battle, Eisenhower, D-Day, and the Birth of the American Superpower. Mr. Paradis returns to the show to discuss his latest book, which is a new biography on Dwight Eisenhower that concentrates on the months leading up to D-Day, June 6, 1944. Mr. Paradis, thank you very much for being with us today. Ah, it's a, re- a real pleasure to be on. I guess I should say welcome back to the show, uh, you know, the, the Last Mission in Tokyo. I loved that book. Before we jump into this, can I honestly say it was a true pleasure to read this book? I normally save my compliments for myself, but um, <laughs> I, you, sir, can write with the best of them. I, I sat down, you know, because this is, you know, you have to read the book so you can do the interview. I read the first well, well, chapter. Well, let me stop you there. You, yeah. you don't have to. You don't, you don't have, have to, <gasps> but it's good. It is very good that you do. <laughs> I did not know. I did not know that was an option. I'm going to fire my agent. Anyway, so I read the first chapter and I was like, oh, my God, this is this is a thing of beauty. So I I gave it my highest recommendation. I took the book. I went out onto the porch, smoked my cigar and read through it for a couple of nights. And I'm just saying, you, sir, can write with the best of them. And uh, it was it was a pleasure. To read. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That that you're making me blush uh, okay. right now. Your your well, listeners can't see that, which is no, probably. I, I was going to say it's a good thing this is audio only because we wouldn't <laughs> want that. Okay, <laughs> so so let's jump into this. So let's talk about Ike before he was the Ike that we all think of in the history books. Now your book focuses on the months leading up to D Day, June sixth. Uh, with appropriate flashbacks, which really, which really, I, I appreciated very much because it gave everything context. But while reading this, I found myself slowly, incrementally getting tense, and I, I didn't even realize it was happening at the time. But I didn't appreciate the stress this man was under when I assumed everybody on his side would would willingly put their ego aside, work together as a team. You know, whatever's good for me, good for the team is good for me. That wasn't always the case. No, it was rarely the case. <laughs> you know, was, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a reason he smoked, you know, three packs of cigarettes a day, which, yeah. you know, I, I calculated, did like a back of the envelope calculation on that. And I was like, he was smoking like almost every waking hour of the day. It's incredible yeah. um, that he did that. No, he, the, the, just the tremendous pressure and stress he was under, both from, you know, the obvious, which is, you know, the D-Day invasion was you know, certainly the highest risk operation of the Second World War in terms of its scale, right. in terms in terms of how consequential failure might be, in terms of how much the uh, Allies expected to lose on the first day, right? Ah. The conservative estimates for like a quarter uh, of the men would be casualties. There were some analysts as late as like, eight, I think it was April or May, mm-hmm. uh, predicting about half would be lost in the uh, in the invasion. So. You know, just just the goal itself was something to you know that would certainly make me smoke three packs a day. Um, <laughs> but then, but then, as you say, right, it it wasn't a matter of everyone wanting to point in the same direction and then go. Um, everyone knew the stakes, but also every a lot of people, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people, and particularly a lot of important people, all had their own agendas. Um, you know, the British never fully came around to Operation Overlord, uh, certainly Churchill, it never really fully came around to Operation Overlord um, as the, you know, the the pinnacle of allied strategy. 
Um, And then you have people like Charles de Gaulle, who, you know, sees the invasion really as a political opportunity for himself, right? Mm -hmm. It's the moment, the six months leading up to D-Day are when de Gaulle realizes he has maximum leverage over the Americans and to some extent the British as well. And basically uses every stick of that leverage to try and, you know, enhance his own political position, the imperial position of France in the world, which at that point, you know, if nothing else is tenuous. Um, Then you have, you know, inside the American government, you have, you know, people uh, like uh, Ernest King, who's the head of the Navy and Mm -hmm. the Navy generally, which, you know, they would rather be in the Pacific. Um, And to the extent, you know, we're doing anything in Europe, it's, it's seen as just a, you know, a cost against what they're trying to accomplish in the Pacific. And, and then just lots of petty egos, personality conflicts. Like that's one of the things that I think both um, kind of just kept me interested in writing the book more than anything is you have all of these real people in a real circumstance in real, in, in real life with all their own sort of petty foibles and ego conflicts. And then what makes Eisenhower, I think the, the genuine hero of the story. And I, and I really don't say that lightly or to Mm -hmm. just use a cliche, but is that he understood how to lead people and he, and he understood how to lead people who were um, at cross purposes with one another a lot of the time. And And, outranked him. (laughs) And often and very often outranked him (laughs) either because they were the head of a foreign state or uh, the president of the United States. Um, and and yeah, I, and I, I think that's what you know really drew me in the most in the research is understanding Eisenhower as you know the the sort of almost quintessential kind of leader, um, you know, because I you know I certainly grew up and I'm sure you did too, right? You, you, we often confuse charisma with leadership. You know, yes. is, you know Churchill obviously looms very large in, on that score. He was a great leader, but he was great leader. We think of you know his his rousing words, um, mm-hmm. you know, and whether or not it's JFK or Ronald Reagan. Um, or, you know, Barack Obama or even Donald Trump, right? The, the people who, who follow them and love them do so, you know, with a, with a certain passion, largely drawn from their, their ability to speak to them, right? Their oratory. Right. And that's not Eisenhower. Not, Eisenhower no. is not, you know, someone no. who's going to give a big barn burning speech and, and move the world with it. But he's able to, by putting himself second, by putting other people first, you know, by putting the mission ultimately as the, as the goal in a really, really selfless duty bound way, Mm-hmm. Um, he's able to get the best out of the best people um, and get them working in the same direction, even if it requires him to, you know, have a couple heart attacks along the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Um, no, I'm glad you said that, said it that way, because it seems like as I'm reading the book, he's the only one sacrificing his ego. He's the only one who's putting the, you know, the, the fact that he's an American to the side. Most of the other people aren't, you know, you have to be honest. And Churchill was certainly concerned about the British Empire, de Gaulle certainly concerned about the uh, future of France, and let's be honest, FDR is concerned because there's an election coming up, That's and right. if he were to lose 50% of the Americans, things could go very rough for him. So again, and you're absolutely right, he was the one guy going, I, I, I'm not a big showy kind of guy, I'm not making speeches, I don't have the pistols on my hips like Patton, but he, he was the example of sacrificing everything that you need to in order to win. Yeah, it was it was all about winning. And I and I think he learned that more than anything. You know, one mm-hmm. of the, one of the big challenges for me in the book is is getting behind Eisenhower, right? right. It, it's sort of understanding how he came to be that way, which is not obvious, right? He was very careful about talking about himself. He he didn't like it. He was a very private person. Yeah. Um and so in trying to think about, okay, how did he become such a great leader? How did he become the man he was? Um I, you know, tried to read almost everything he read or would have read up to that point. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of really heavy stuff that he picks up and reads, right? He reads von Clausewitz, he reads Friedrich Nietzsche, he reads, you know, all sorts of military history. But honestly, I think the thing that um, shaped his thinking and leadership skills the most was football. Um, yes. He, he was the consummate football coach um, for a number of years. And, he only really became that because he um, he had been playing for Army's you know team as a sophomore at West Point, um, and he you know started you know really doing well. Uh, he he was known as being a real line smasher. He was a real physical guy, mm-hmm. um, and he actually played in probably the most famous college football game in all of human history, which is the <laughs> the Army Carlisle game in which Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indians crushed West Point um, at home. Um, and he, you know, is, is 
kind of hoping in a per, you know pri- in his private thoughts to right. uh, go on to be a professional athlete and blows his knee out in the next game uh oh. never recovers ever and it almost looks like he's going to be drummed out of the army uh yeah. because they'll, you know they'll let him graduate but they're not going to keep a guy with the, who can't you know run that fast um in the officer corps at that point yeah. and his saving grace is that he goes on to the coaching staff uh, and really learns the the ropes of coaching a team, right? Of really getting a team to work together, mm-hmm. and so that you know. And, and football certainly is one of those games, one of those team sports where you can have star players, and that's real important. But at the end of the day, they have to work as a team. It's the only way to win a football game. Exactly. Um, and and he very, I think that more than anything else, his love of football and his real just you know his, his education in the game of football and and coaching football, I think shapes his, his basic understanding of how to lead people in a selfless way. Right. It's very rare that we talk about football coaches. Um, Exactly. We do sometimes, certainly when they lose. Um, Right. Talk about them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Can can I just say real quick, when I got to that part of the book, I had to smile because I grew up, my father was in the military. I grew up on air force bases and football and the coaching of football semi-religious, like, if you will. I mean, they take this very seriously. But 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 your point is an excellent one because the Army can look at Ike, see that he's an effective coach. That can easily translate into an effective leader. He's going to get an opportunity. But, and that leads me to my next question. As I'm going through this book, uh, it's a none too gentle reminder that even in the military, certainly at the level that he was at and he wanted to go further, that politics are involved. Politics are always involved. And I remember reading several biographies on George Washington, and he, he himself, in a letter campaign, had to, you know, kind of advocate for himself. And Ike is going to do the same thing. And I quickly realized through these letters, Um, Ike is battling more than just the Axis powers. He's literally like, I want this. I can do it. Yes, he's humble. He comes from a very simple, plain, hardworking background. But but, and and I I don't think anything's wrong with this. He wanted this job. He really believed that he could do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, his um, you know, the people who knew him well knew how ambitious he really was. Mm -hmm. And and he but he had that, you know, he's a Kansan for one thing. Um, (laughs) And. And but you know, and I think there's uh, you know, I don't think it's all bullshit. I think it's I think there's a genuine humility to it as well mm-hmm. that that was just you know really part of his bones. Um, but he, you know, understood that he, he understood two things. One is he he understood that in order to succeed, he couldn't look like he was trying that hard to succeed. And right. you know, and and that's a political instinct, right? He he had he had the political just sense to know, particularly at a time of such great turmoil and such great, you know, uh, just ambition, right. Where you have these people like Churchill, Stalin, Hitler, you know, Roosevelt, uh, certainly MacArthur, uh, Bernard Montgomery, right. These larger than life personalities who Mm -hmm. lived larger than life, right. They all, they knew they were historic figures and seemed to relish that opportunity every chance they got. Um, he understood in that environment, that if he was going to, if if he bought into that, if he was going to be seen as just as ambitious as all those folks were, they wouldn't trust him. Other people wouldn't trust him, and there would be this, you know, that he would actually, as a consequence, be less effective um, right. in being le- able to lead people. And a um, a good example of that, who you know, I talk about a fair bit in the book, is um, Mark Wayne Clark, uh, who's probably one of his best friends, certainly at the mm-hmm. beginning of the war. Mm-hmm. Um, but Clark. Um, is, you know, a tall, good looking guy, full head of hair. Um, (laughs) And in the beginning, uh, and he had a beautiful wife who goes on like essentially a USO tour, raising money, um, you know, telling about his exploits. And, you know, Mark Clark is, you know, very, very savvy, very smart, very well positioned general at the start of the war. Um, But increasingly the people around him, particularly George Marshall, his boss, um, grow to distrust him because Mark Clark seems to be enjoying his celebrity status. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, Marshall, I think, was at best ambivalent about how many military officers were becoming celebrities during the war. Um, But the worst thing you could do uh, was be seen to be enjoying it. And and so Eisenhower, you know, understood in the political, in a real small P political way that the more famous he became, the more, um, you know, people looked up to him and started banding his name out as a future president or anything else, Ooh, yeah. the more he had to be like, oh, no, shucks, no, I'd rather just <laughs> fishing. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just a simple Kansan. I, I'm just a simple yeah. man. I'd like yeah. to just yeah, win this war and get on home, you know. like a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was something in the book. I just want to go home and fish and sit on the porch and drink coffee and talk to him. I mean, he, he, he knew how to play the game. But that reminds me of something. I, um, I was – talking to a, a British gentleman one day and he, he made the point something like, how can you be a superpower? And yet there seems to be a thread in American culture about don't be too cocky. That yeah. does, to him, that didn't make sense. And I, and I said, well, let me, let me try to explain it this way. And again, going back to football, you can make the best, hardest, most fierce, but legal tackle in the NFL where everybody in this crowd goes, Ooh, but the second you start gloating about that, mm. That turns off a lot yeah. of American people, and, and and again, it's 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 you know maybe it doesn't line up, but yeah, he knew to go. Okay, I really want this. I think I can do the job. Let me do just enough to get attention and to keep my my name on their lips, but not too much where I'm actually turning Marshall, uh, FDR, or, or whoever away from me because it's it's gaudy to the American concept. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, and I, and I'd just say two hopefully quick things about that. One yeah. is. You know, I think that was, you know, not just core to his effectiveness because it got the, his peers to trust him. Mm-hmm. But I also think it was essential to get the people, you know, to people, the right people to do the right thing for him as well. Right? right. Leadership is not just about, again, being able to point in the right direction or even having the best ideas. It's getting the best out of people. Right. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen time and time again in history is you know, these sort of megalomaniac megalomaniac leaders that we sometimes get, you Mm -hmm. know, have, you know, you know, who bask in their own fame and where it's all about them. Um, You know, the best people don't want to work for them for any number of reasons. And so what ends up happening is the only people who end up working for people like that are, you know, are toadies and yes men um, who inevitably are not going to say, you know, the hard things that need to be said uh, to disagree with that sort of megalomaniacal personality. And often that leads to disaster, right? So just in terms of, you know, the, the fundamentals of leadership, getting people to do their best, getting the best people to do their best, that kind of humility is why Eisenhower, I think, was not only just an incredibly effective general, right? We 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 almost take him for granted, yes. um, but also an incredibly effective president, right? He's he's certainly one of the most accomplished presidents of the 20th century, maybe second only to Roosevelt. I, and I struggle to think of who would even compete with him, right. uh, otherwise. Yeah, um, it, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no it, but I, but I would just say quickly too on the second thing. You, you know, the yeah. question your friend asked, like, how could a superpower go around being sort of like all oh, shocks and whatever? <laughs> I, I think the same. <laughs> I think the same basic politics, the basic, basic human politics works at the, the big political level, too. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the, the points that I try and bring out in the book is how consequential Eisenhower was to America's ability to rise as a superpower. Because, you know, by the time the United States, by the time D-Day is, you know, by, by the time Eisenhower is put in charge of planning D-Day, December of 1943, right. the United States has gone from being a kind of disorganized, somewhat reclusive you know, economically large, but not particularly well focused, you know, mm-hmm. nation state uh, somewhere out between the Atlantic and the Pacific <laughs> um, to in 1943, you know, having a global logistics network that is bar none uh, to producing seven times as many ships as the British Empire, which to that point had been, you know, the Navy that conquered the world. Right. Um to be producing double of pretty much everything else, whether or not it's planes, tanks, guns, you name it. Uh, we have a suddenly extremely large army. Um, you know, increasingly our economic power is, is following our political power and our political power is following our economic power. So at a, you know, at that point in history, it is entirely appropriate for everyone in the world to be terrified of right. the United States, right? Like yeah. we were way more powerful than the Soviet Union, way more powerful than the Germans, and look what they were up to. And oh, yes. so, you know, the idea that the United States could rise the way it did without, you know, real meaningful opposition from the incumbent empires, not the least being the British Empire, um, that that took something. And I think a big part of what it took was people not seeing the rise of the United States as threatening. And, you know, the worst thing you could do in that kind of situation is start, you know, prancing about and, you know, demanding everything, you know, for the greater prestige and glory of the American empire, because, you know, that's going to, that's going to provoke opposition in all corners pretty fast um, that you're now going to have to overcome. But instead, by, 
you know, holding out the promise of things like democracy and um, and human rights and, mm-hmm. you know, decolonization as well. Um, the United States was able to base and and then I'll actually add this one because I think it's incredibly important to Eisenhower. The idea of multilateralism, right, of yes. always working with allies, of taking your allies seriously, even when you don't even have to. Right. Because you're much more economically and militarily powerful than them by by coming to the world stage, by taking our position in the limelight historically as a superpower with that kind of attitude. It made it possible for the United States to be a preeminent superpower because otherwise I, we would have been we would have been like the Soviet Union. We would have been fighting on our on our borders left and right. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, bit to get 30, bit to get 20, 20, 20, bit to get 20, 20, bit to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. That was a good point. And that reminds me because, and you could easily argue when World War II starts, you know, the British have their empire. The America is gangly at best, but with potential, let's be honest. But by by the time 1943 comes around, we're, we're, we're kind of running the show. I mean, the Soviets are doing what the Soviets do, but as far as the British and the, the Free French, it's America's call to make. Having said that, Churchill is certainly, you know, banding about the idea of a British general running overlord, the D-Day operations, because he's not going to, you know, he firmly believes in the empire. He's not going to willingly give it up. And if he can stick one of his own into positions of supreme power like that, he's going to do that. And I, and I think you said this a couple of minutes ago, Churchill was never 100% on board with D-Day because yep. he, he could not just help but think about the British Channel running red with blood. Oh, yeah. No, I, absolutely. Um, you know, Churchill's Churchill's opposition to Overlord is complicated too, right? He, yes. you know, part of it is he had, um, you know, been the architect of the Gallipoli <laughs> operation, Good which point. the, you know, D-Day invasion is essentially, you know, the the Gallipoli invasion on steroids in terms of its yes. scale, in terms <laughs> of the risks, uh, in terms of the, he, he just, he saw how badly it could go. It really almost ended his political career during World War One. So that's, right. you know, a big sort of like specter that's hanging over him is that you know, the failure of this operation is is imminent right is is very yes. is, is easily is very easy to see and could be catastrophic um you know also the british just as a matter of military doctrine had historically no you know they relied on their strengths that's naval power um certainly by the 1920s 30s and 40s it's air power mm-hmm. um and part of British military doctrine that's at that point well over 100 years old is avoid large land wars in, in Europe. Yes. Um, and the one time they went back on that, <laughs> you know, the one time they broke that rule, World War I happens. Right. Um, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of British, uh, the flower of Britain's youth, as Churchill was wont to say, you know, are just ground to death on the Western Front for, for nothing. Right. For no great advance, if anything, it hastens the rise of fascism in Europe. So, you know, he sees the risks, he sees the costs. The Britain at that point had been at war for over five years. And so they're not eager to to take, you know, a high risk, high casualty operation Mm -hmm. um, that's going to potentially, you know, just kill tens of thousands of people and set the, the, the pace of the war back. When from his van- vantage point, you know, Britain could use its traditional strengths, you know, on the seas and in the air yeah. to essentially weaken Germany um, and allow the Russians to do a lot of the ground fighting um, right. and we essentially weaken Germany until there was the time to, you know, make a coup de gras, you know, like a bullfight. You weaken the bull before you strike. Right. Um, but that had, as you as you suggest, the not incidental benefit of allowing Great Britain to use the war as a crisis to expand its own imperial reach. Um, that was certainly true across the Mediterranean into the Middle East. Um, and so Churchill very much saw the Middle East as the, you know, as the prime theater of the long war, uh, mm-hmm. particularly because he was concerned about Soviet ambitions in Eastern Europe. And so by uh, expanding essentially the Allied, you know, British and Allied presence in the Eastern Mediterranean in places like the Balkans um, and Turkey, he was, you know, confident that they could cut off uh, the Soviets from, you know, expanding their own sphere of influence for when, you know, what I think Churchill even at that time saw 
would be the next war, what we now call the Cold War. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there was a, you know, a combination of, I think, politics and just genuine, you know, Re, you know, terror, if not, you know, if, if not sort of mourning and, and concern for, for what D-Day would cost the British. Absolutely. As, as the saying goes, everything is relative, or you can also say everything is always relative. The British are certainly thinking about their past. The Churchill's thinking about the future, and he makes certain decisions that may not be best for the overall, overall Allied war effort, but they're certainly good for Britain. And, and again, Churchill is human too. You can't, you can't sure. never forget that. So let's put, just for the fun of it, let's put Ike right in the middle of it. Let's put him in the thick of things. So he had been up to this point, the European theater uh, of operations commander, basically, you know, kind of in charge of Operation Borleo, the supplies coming over, the troops coming over from the U.S. onto the U.K. And now that they finally agreed, despite Churchill, that there will be a cross-channel invasion, there's talk of putting General George Marshall, chief of staff of the army, into this position. And why not? I mean, FDR's thing is, this guy is kind of like a god to everybody. He deserves to be in the history books. Why not give the top man the top job? Yeah, for sure. But Um, he doesn't get it in the end. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, no, you're entirely right. And it's not just that, you know, everyone sort of comes to think Marshall should have the job. Eisenhower, when he um, is working in the War Department in 1942, drafts Mm -hmm. um, some of the initial plans for what would become Operation Overlord. And uh, he more or less tries to write himself into the plan (laughs) as Marshall's assistant. Uh, He basically says at one point, eventually, you know, the... the, uh, um, uh, chief of staff of the army will have to come over and lead the battle from the front, and he should have a very trusty assistant at his hand who knows what he's doing. Uh, and then Eisenhower basically goes on to describe himself without naming himself. So it's sort of a you know, so Eisenhower is certainly expecting um, Marshall to come lead Operation Overlord. Um, but by this point in the war, I, you know Eisenhower is really just kind of regretting that not not because he doesn't think Marshall deserves it. I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But right. um, you know, for the previous year, Eisenhower had been the Allied commander in the Mediterranean, first with the operations in North Africa and then Sicily, then Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, he was on track to um, you know uh, attack and ultimately capture Rome, and he knew that uh, or had been told basically that when Marshall came over to lead Operation Overlord, the British were going to insist on a British commander in the Mediterranean. In essence, mm-hmm. that was the compromise. It, you know, To the extent the British were going to be willing to go along with Operation Overlord, that would come with the strings being um, that the British would get command in Southeast Asia as well as the Mediterranean, which from a political and imperial standpoint were far more significant to uh, Britain's longer-term strategy. Oh, yes. um, and Eisenhower hates this idea. He, the last thing he wants is to go back to Washington as the chief of staff of the army, which is, you know, in, on, in one sense, you know, the greatest promotion he could get. It's the top job in the army. But in another sense, it's a thankless, horrible job, right? <laughs> he would be, he's at a desk politicking at the Pentagon and making Eisenhower even sort of more vulnerable in the job is that he would be in charge of the Pacific and the European theaters. And the Pacific theater at that point for the army was headed by his former mentor, General Douglas MacArthur, mm-hmm. and his... Uh, and the European theater would be headed by his former mentor, George Marshall. Um, wow. And so, yeah, he yeah. would be essentially s- supervising two people who had n- no interest in <laughs> respecting his decisions about anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. And listening to him. Yeah. Listening yeah. to him for sure. Um, and and so, you know, it was a thankless, almost impossible job. Um, but that's what Eisenhower is expecting in November of 1943. And there's a kind of fateful um I, w- I would just call it sightseeing tour um, that I, right. that I spend a lot of time describing in the book because I think it is really consequential because what happens is Roosevelt um, is on his way to Cairo uh, for the big Cairo conference, which then is also going to lead to the big Tehran conference where Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt meet for the first time. Mm-hmm. But on his way, he stops uh, in Algiers uh, in Iran to uh, meet with Eisenhower and they set the president up in a villa right outside of Carthage, and um, the president ends up having to stay an extra day. And Eisenhower says, hey, well, uh, you want me to take you out for a tour of the battlefield? <laughs> and sure enough, they spend a day together. Um, it's Eisenhower with uh, some of um, Roosevelt and Roosevelt's sons, as well as Kay Summersby, um, uh, Eisenhower's driver at the time. And they spend the day together. And in that day, 
um, they get to know each other really for the first time, right? As mm-hmm. consequential and as sort of popular as Eisenhower was, he's not someone that Roosevelt knew very well. Um, right. uh, he, Roosevelt, if anything, knew his uh, Eisenhower's younger brother, Milton, better than he knew Eisenhower. Mm-hmm. And they spend the day together. Eisenhower um, basically charms the president. The president charms Eisenhower. They, <laughs> they get along smashingly well. Right. Um, there are a lot of moments where Roosevelt is is really quite clearly testing Eisenhower, uh, yeah. you know, testing his loyalty, testing his mettle, testing his cool under pressure. And um, and then he goes off to the Cairo conference, uh, insists that Eisenhower come to the Cairo conference as well to give a presentation to the combined chiefs, which which Eisenhower does um, with extreme confidence and and and, uh, and clarity. Mm-hmm. And. Um, Roosevelt takes the chance to, you know, pin an award on Eisenhower while he's in Cairo and he thanks him and he says, he's got a lot more great things coming to him. Nice. Uh, and then weeks go by, uh, right? <laughs> weeks go by. Eisenhower is essentially as depressed as he possibly could be anticipating yeah. his return to Washington. Um, and then he learns, uh, almost by accident that the president has appointed him instead of general Marshall to be the head of the allied operation, uh, across the channel operation overlord. And, you know, he's surprised. He's stunned. He he really gets this, I think, second wind, this new life just like fills through him um, at this opportunity and this chance. And um, but it's a great you know question. It's like, well, why did that happen? <laughs> right. How did that happen? Yes. Uh, why wasn't it General Marshall? And, um, you know, it's General Marshall is a stoic. He's a professional soldier. He's he's really, you know, a soldier's soldier. And he never lets on or never says anything to Eisenhower that would lead him to believe that he had any resentment. But, you know, Marshall basically doesn't talk to Eisenhower for several weeks, um, which is unusual for them at that point because they're normally corresponding almost every day. And and this gives Eisenhower a lot of, I think, just anxiety about, you know, does Marshall feel betrayed? Um, And but what ultimately is, I think, fascinating is why Roosevelt made that decision. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, Roosevelt himself gave a lot of different reasons to different people at different times, um, (laughs) to include, to include Marshall himself. Um, but I think it was a combination of things ultimately. One is that, you know, moving Marshall to Europe was going to be politically unpopular domestically. Um, you know, uh, Marshall had more credibility on Capitol Hill than anybody, the most, most certainly more than Roosevelt did. Um, Mm -hmm. it was said that Marshall could, uh, kill an entire proposal simply by, letting on in a meeting with a congressman that it was what Roosevelt wanted as opposed to what he wanted. Um, And so, yeah, you know, he's a, he's a man of just incredible effectiveness and trust. And, you know, there's a lot of concern, not necessarily that Roosevelt or or that Eisenhower can't handle the job, but certainly that no one is George Marshall. Um, Exactly. And so that's a big part of it. And, and Roosevelt even says to Marshall, I don't think I could sleep with you out of the country. Um, wow. So that, that, that's a big I, I think that is a big part of it. And that overcomes, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, interest in that Roosevelt has genuinely does have in giving Marshall the limelight that he deserves for history uh, by leading the invasion. But I think just as important in Roosevelt's thinking, and he says this privately to a number of different people at different times as well, mm-hmm. is he was concerned about Marshall's ability to get along with the British <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, one of the big. One of the big, you know, things that you know Operation Overlord is going to entail is the importation of 1.5 million Americans into the British Isles. You know, yeah. uh, 20,000 tons of material. You have, um, and and then a lot of politicking just to make it all happen, right? Especially, yeah. you know, Roosevelt at this point fully understands Churchill's, uh, you know, if not outright hostility, certain certainly deep skepticism of Operation Overlord, and he understands that it's going to take a certain amount of of politesse um, to right. to make the to keep the alliance together to make the D Day invasion successful, and one of the things that happens at the Cairo conference is you know a series of these meetings nearly break out into a brawl yes. uh, between Marshall and some of his British counterparts. Oh. Um, at one point, Churchill is is just demanding that the Allies commit fully to um, capturing the islands of the Dodecanese, which is an Italian archipelago, mm-hmm. and particularly the island of Rhodes, you know, the, as in the Colossus of Rhodes, right? These great right. ancient, ancient places. Um, and at one point, um, Marshall just like shouts at him and like pounds the table. It's like, not one American soldier is going to die on that goddamn beach, right? Oh. And, oh. <laughs> and right, it, it's, it gets ugly. And, and Roosevelt privately writes back um, to his secretary about, 
how he's been very stressed out by essentially having to play the peacemaker between his British his British uh, hosts and the American <laughs> chiefs of staff. Right. And so, you know, spending a day with someone like Dwight Eisenhower, right, who's, who's – poker face you know whose smile is a poker face yes um is i think tips eisen or tips roosevelt off to eisenhower's great political gifts which i don't mm-hmm. know that roosevelt had really ever had any insight into prior to that point right. and in thinking about who is going to be best positioned not only to get the nuts and bolts of a military operation right but to be you know the the american proconsul in mm-hmm. London, right? To be the person who's going to be the face of America, not just in London, but actually in Europe at that point. Um, right. Who who will have that, you know, soft touch to be able to get things done, to keep the alliance together? Eisenhower starts looking like the man for the job. And yeah. probably yeah. one of Roosevelt's greatest legacies is in launching Dwight Eisenhower's political career uh, with that decision. Because it's, it's in those six months leading up to D-Day that Eisenhower really both you know, learns to really use his political strengths, sharpens them, and becomes ultimately the you know preeminent figure of the 20th century that he ultimately becomes. Right. Certainly after Tehran, it's not going to be Marshall, because like you said, uh, I think FDR went from president to referee. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and the part that made me laugh out loud in the book was there Stalin smoking his pipe, just smiling, watching these two guys go out. It's like, oh, you capitalist! You're just, yeah. Oh my! Look, we're trying to survive here, and you're you're worried about positions and prestige. I mean, he he was he was entertained at the very least, I guess. Yeah, um, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you you reminded me of something else. So here, here we are. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about you know team playing. And you're right. I mean, General Marshall, for all of his attributes, for all of the positive things about him, the fact that Churchill and the other British um, senior staff can get under his skin and make him explode like that. Yeah, FDR has got to be able to see for himself. "Mm, Yeah, no, no, Mm -hmm. this is not going to work. But the biggest thing is, and, and this is something I certainly try to live by. My father taught it to me, who's in the military. If it ain't broke. Don't fix it. And having Marshall in Washington run things, things are going pretty well. You don't want to mess with that. Oh, yeah. The, everyone else on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, right? So the head of the Air Force, the Navy, and um, head of the Air Force and the Navy um, opposed Marshall going over to lead Operation Overlord because yeah. they're like, we have a winning team. We know how to work together, right? This is not yeah. the, this this crucial moment um, in in the war, right, where we're finally beginning to get real momentum, not only against the Germans but the Japanese, is not the time for a big personnel shakeup. Um, Ex- yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's exactly right. So on a, on a much lighter note, if for a moment, if I if I may, when FDR was in North Africa, and again, I think I enjoyed this a little too much. He would tease. Ike about his driver, a certain K Summersby. I guess he'd heard the rumors or whatever, but just the fact, I mean, you're the president, you can do what you want, but the fact that he was just kind of goading Ike, you know, and, and also you had to think it was a bit of a test as well to see if he could hold his temper, but, but that was an interesting thing. But I think at the time it was probably more forgivable or excusable. I'm not sure which word to use as far as their very close relationship. Yeah, it's well. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what adjectives uh, are best for it. It was certainly scandalous, right? It was something that yes. like everyone always uh, enjoyed raising an eyebrow about Eisenhower's relationship with Kay Summersby. Yeah. Um, you know the the precise nature of their relationship. You know, you know, was it a sexual relationship, and if how sexual was it? Mm-hmm. Kind of, you know, to me. Um, you know, this probably isn't great for readers. To me, it's not that interesting. Uh, right? sure. It's also not it's also none of my business, right? At the end of the Absolutely. day, these are these are public people, but they also have private lives that we should respect. Yeah. Um, but I do think the the closeness of their relationship um, was extremely important. Um, some for some reasons, you know, some of the reasons you say, right? It's it, everyone thought they were having an affair, and and they um, and so they interacted with Eisenhower on that basis, right? Mm-hmm. They, they understood and made a special point. And Churchill certainly makes a special point of always being very friendly to Kay. Um, and she was one of the few people, um, who Eisenhower really could trust, right? It's, yes. it's, it's that, that's the, yes. you know, really stark and almost sad thing. Um, you can see in these, you know, portraits of leadership when you really dig in, um, as I try to do here and kind of get into the day to day, 
what mm-hmm. it's like to have this job. Um, it's very lonely, right? Everyone oh, yeah. has an agenda that you deal with. Everyone, um, even the people who work for you, um, are you know oftentimes angling for their own position under your sort of you know overarching um, you know sort of umbrella, mm-hmm. or they're you know keeping an eye on writing a book, <laughs> or right. you know in some way or another exploiting their closeness to you for their own ends and. So it's really, really hard to have anyone to relax with, to trust um, in, in at, at a time when, you know, as you noted before, you're just under constant stress, constant yes. pressure. Um, well, yeah. And so I think Kay Summers, more than anything else, was just someone he felt warm to and could trust. And they had, uh, you know, an ability to just spend, you know, ca- downtime with each other. And he didn't have to worry about her you know, angling for some position or, or betraying him to the British or, you know, you, you name it. Right. Right. Um, she was someone he could, he could trust, uh, in his inner circle, uh, to relax with. And, and why I say that more than anything, I'll, I'll just sort of close on this is he's right. He writes a letter to his brother, Milton, who's very eager to try and get, um, to raise Eisenhower's profile in the United States. And this is in the summer of 1944. Mm-hmm. And Milton is trying to get uh, people to write biographies of Eisenhower um, in, in preparation for what Milton certainly sees at that point is Eisenhower's burgeoning political career. Um, yes. And he writes a letter to his brother basically saying, look, there are only four people uh, who I would trust to write uh, about my time here in England. Uh, one of them is Walter Bedell Smith, Beale Smith, his chief mm-hmm. of staff. Uh, one of them is Tex Lee, his uh, aide de camp. Uh, one of them is Harry Butcher, who ultimately does write a book about uh, their time together called My Three Years with Eisenhower, who's sort of his naval aide and, and sort of on staff best buddy. Right. Um, and the fourth is Kay Summersby, right? She's wow. the only woman of that group. Um, she's the only sort of non sort of major military figure of that group. Um, and, and that just gives you a sense of how much he trusted her and how close they were. Um, right. You know, was that the kind of it, was it a, was it genuinely a scandal, scandalous relationship? Who knows? Uh, I don't think we'll ever really know, but um, yeah. but I think it's a cer- it was certainly a very close relationship that raised an awful lot of eyebrows uh, at the time. Right. Well, in the book, I lost count of the number of times again for practically six months. This guy is having a bad day every day and she's able to take him out of himself. She's able to say something to make him smile, laugh, distract him with a game of bridge, going horseback riding. And you've got to think if it wasn't for her, there might have been a couple of more heart attacks or or, or whatever. So she <laughs> yeah. certainly fulfilled a very vital duty and the simple act of distraction from, yeah. from the daily cares. Yeah, yeah. It's really un- easy to underestimate how important that just satisfying those human needs are. And, I, and I, yes. just that human need to relax, think about anything else than World War II. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, no, she, she very much did that for him. Because uh, Ike's letters to his wife were very loving. He missed her very much. I mean, it was almost like a 16-year-old, you know, writing to his first girlfriend. It was very sappy, but he, he obviously loved his wife very passionately. And in the letters, he could kind of pour it all out. And I'm sure he missed her very much. Oh, he really did. You know, yeah. his letters his letters are utterly adorable and endearing, <laughs> especially, you know, it's, like, especially when you read the original. I, I got a chance to get as many of the originals as possible, right. um, which are up at auction, and you can find them in old auction catalogs and things like that. And um, and they're handwritten. And I just sometimes would laugh by just the number of exclamation points he would use, right? <laughs> like, I, I tried to imagine, like, Erwin Rommel writing to his wife with the same sort of, like, sappy yeah. cuteness and no. you know all that sort of stuff no. and it was it was hard to, i'm not saying he didn't i don't know i didn't read his right. letters but, right but there is something just they, they had this very um you know adorable relationship uh, yeah. i think their entire lives and, and she was very much a you know a, 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 i think a rock in his own life right they had yes. a very difficult relationship at times as everyone who's married does right it's not marriage isn't easy um, right. They lost a child together, and I, and I can't right. even imagine, um, you know, what that was like. It, it right. was, you know, it just breaks your heart. Um, yes, but yes. that she was a rock, really, through you know to the day he died, and and you see that warmth, you see that you know that love and care and nurturing. But they're also hundreds of you know thousands of miles away for years on end, and it's it's exactly. a very difficult it's a very difficult way to live. Yeah, it it would have been better for him if she had been there, but that's not how the army and war works. So he did the best he could. So yeah. y- you mentioned earlier, so it's December 5th, 1943. 
Ike gets the message from General Marshall. It will be him, Ike, heading up Overlord. But that's not the that's not the end of his problems. That's just the beginning of his problems. And we're going to go through some of those in just a moment. But and this is something if you know anything about World War II or if you know anything about D-Day, you've at least heard of it. Can you give us an idea of the landing craft situation? But also <laughs> how it because I was like, oh my goodness, if I hear landing craft one more time. But anyway, and how it ties into the fighting in Italy, because there was like most things in war, there's a lot of interconnectedness. Yeah, there, there are. Every, every, there's always trade-offs, and everything yes. affects everything else. Absolutely. So, the, you know, one of the main, one of the first things Eisenhower does, and and this is a, probably you know one of his most consequential decisions that's somewhat underrated in terms of the the ranking of his consequential decisions, mm-hmm. and that is almost immediately seeing that the the existing plan for Operation Overlord is way too small. Right. Um, at that time, it's about 100,000 men are expected to cross the channel with the single objective of taking the northern uh, French city of Caen. Mm-hmm. And um, Eisenhower looks at that plan, thinks not only about his you know, you know wealth of military history experience, but just his own personal experience in launching the invasions in North Africa and then Sicily and then in Salerno, right. and just sees immediately this plan is way too small and takes way too many risks. They're putting too many men on too small um, a beach. Um, they're not mm-hmm. creating enough opportunities to expand the front, because, which essentially is a way of hedging your bets. Right. And so the very first thing he does, and it's just not strong enough, right? He knows that there are basically a half a million Germans with armor uh, yes. in France who can get to the beaches of Normandy within about a week. And so if they're just going across the English Channel with 100,000 men, assuming they can even get into France, um, they're going to meet, you know, a, a, a repulsing force that's almost five times their size. Right. And so one of the first things he does is, um, you know, he talks to Walter Bedell Smith, Beadle Smith. He says, we have to expand this operation. Uh, I would, you know, triple it if I could, quadruple it even. Mm-hmm. And um, and that is 100 percent at cross purposes with the British intent. Right. Because the British they don't like this operation to begin with, right. um, both because they think it's you know a fool's errand, but also because anything that's invested in northern France will necessarily come at the expense of the now British-led operations in the Mediterranean, uh, oh, yes. which is which is really one of the major British objectives at this point. Um, and Eisenhower knows this, right? This is where Eisenhower's political instincts come in, and so he. Uh, not with authority, uh, or at least with a very ambiguous authority to do it, right. um, brings Bernard Montgomery to his headquarters right after Christmas um, and tells Montgomery, you know, I don't want this to be an American and British operation. I want this to be led by Bernard Montgomery, right? Yes. The, the Montgomery of Al Alamein. And um, basically bear hugs this guy who <laughs> at the very best – you know, in the very best light, had a had a touch and go relationship with Eisenhower uh, right. throughout their careers. Uh, but Eisenhower understands that if they're going to get an expansion of Operation Overlord, it can't come from him. Uh, it can't come from an American. It has to come from Bernard Montgomery to get the British to buy into that. Uh. And so sure enough, he says, and don't you think, Monty, that this operation <laughs> should just be a lot bigger than it is, especially if you're leading it? Like you need to lead something much more substantial and right. montgomery is like absolutely i need a much bigger <laughs> operation to lead under my under my mantle right. um and and so he does right and so monty ultimately is the one who um you know spends the time in early uh, january 1944 to expand the operation into what we now know um as the d-day landings across not just the three beaches near Khan, but also utah and omaha beach at the mm-hmm. content peninsula and um but that immediately creates the exact tension uh, that Rose uh, that that Churchill was afraid of, right? In 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 the Cairo conference, he says, right. "You know, we can't let Overlord become a tyrant um, to all of our other opportunities." Um, and so immediately, there's this question of like, okay, well, how are we going to double this operation? How are we going to get the landing craft? And yeah. sure enough, this puts Eisenhower in the middle of one of the great and most tedious fights of the second world war. <laughs> yeah, um, perfect it, word. <laughs> it is. It's the battle of the, they call it the battle of the numbers eventually, because it's everyone is sitting there with the sort of 1940s equivalent of spreadsheets saying, right. well, if we put this many men on an LST and that many men on an LCA and, you know, 
And everyone all of a sudden becomes these landing craft accountants. And it seems, again, on its face, like almost a ridiculous debate over over literal numbers. Um, right. But underlying it, it are some of the great political divisions of the war, right? You have this British-American divide over whether or not they should be even investing in uh, the invasion of France versus operations in the Mediterranean, because every mm-hmm. landing craft that gets sent to the English Channel is a landing craft that's not going into the Mediterranean. But you also have the Navy, right? The, the United States Navy wants to be fighting a war in the Pacific. They're conducting the island hopping. The famous island hopping campaign is already underway. Uh, the Navy has their own bottomless uh, demand for landing craft to get the Marines from you know one little archipelago and atoll in the Pacific to another. Right. And so the Navy has zero, and zero interest in Europe at this point. <laughs> and so they're completely unwilling to let uh, landing craft go to Europe, especially if the British are going to siphon them off for the Mediterranean in in, in any event. Um, yeah. And so yeah. Eisenhower just has, you know, uh, endless round of negotiation after endless round of negotiation, just eking out every every landing craft almost on a boat by boat basis um, until he ultimately is able to get what he needs. And it's it's one of the more exhausting uh, <laughs> parts of the war. But I think it also, you know, really shows the kind of pressures he was under where it, it, it seems, you know, certainly it's, it, you know, certain things just seem, um, you know, very trivial. Like why can't everyone just pull ahead, right? This is D-Day, obviously yeah. it's important. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you know, I mean, people have their own agendas. There's their own politics involved. And, and Eisenhower is the one ha- who has to sort of put that mission, the D-Day mission um, at the head of everything to try and get everyone uh, to go along to give him what he needs to make it the success that it ultimately becomes. Right. And, and and I think that's another reason that I enjoy this book very much because what I try to do, and, and it's almost impossible, but what I try to do is when I read a book like yours, I try to forget that Ike's, it's a foregone conclusion that Ike is going to run this. It's a foregone conclusion that this is going to work. You know, it's like they don't know the future like we do our past. And so that makes it more impressive that here's a gentleman fighting all of these different forces. And most of them are as the people on his side. But bit by bit, drip by drip, even though it's costing him probably years off his life, he's smoking cigarettes, he's throwing them in the fireplace, but he's able to get what he wants. He can't command FDR. He can't command Trump. Churchill, but over time he's able to, you know, if you want to win, he gets what he wants. And the other thing about Monty, again, this is an example of leadership. No one bosses Monty around. If you know anything about Monty, he's a right pain in the ass, if you know what I'm saying. But he's able to use that aggressive tendencies of Monty to his uh, advantage. And again, that's just another brilliant example of leadership. I'm going to use your talents to further the overall bigger cause. He he has the ability to understand, you know, not only, you know, what the goal is and to keep, always keep that goal in mind, but he also has a really just deft insight into people and what their strengths are and yes. what their weaknesses are and how as a leader, his job is to complement their strengths and to make up for their weaknesses. And, and Monty is a great example, right? Monty gets some pretty you know, harsh treatment in most, <laughs> in, certainly in most biographies of Eisenhower and mine's no real exception, right? I, 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 I think Monty gave, you know, took enough years off Eisenhower's life that it's <laughs> worth writing about. Um, but he also was, you know, an incredibly skilled uh, sort of strategist in his own way, right? He understood the set piece battle uh, incredibly well. He yes. understood uh, his men incredibly well. The loyalty that he inspired in the men who, uh, who fought under him, is almost like nothing else. He's very much unlike Patton in that respect, who, you know, was a great sort of battlefield improvisational tactician, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, found it very hard to win the loyalty of too many of his men because, yeah. you know, he could be a little crazy, let's be honest. <laughs> um, and so, I, and Eisenhower knew that and respected that about Monty and so made sure that Monty was always in a position to use his strengths to the greatest effect. And then, you know, as the, as the fighting in Normandy, as most people, you know, who, who studied World War II closely, you know, know, a lot of Monty's strengths became weaknesses um, as, as the battle in Normandy itself became a slog and then Eisenhower right. to take action then. But certainly in that period before D-Day, um, you know, Eisenhower, you know, had to bite his tongue because of Monty's, you know, their relationship, their his, the history of their relationship, to be sure. Oh, but he yes. also understood that Monty had a lot of virtues that he could he could exploit and put to best use, and that Monty was willing to invest because he trusted that Eisenhower was not in it for himself, right? Which, you know, if Bernard Montgomery thinks someone is not in, in it for themselves, <laughs> that, all, that tells you how yeah, deft yeah, Eisenhower really was. Sure. <laughs> 
Yeah. So. Oh, it, it, just for a second, and this is for the World War II aficionados. If I could just go back to the landing craft for a second, you yep. just reminded me, and I and I'm going to paraphrase. I didn't write it down, but there's a there's a paragraph in your book, something along the lines of, the bombers had advocates, the fighters, the fighter planes had advocates mm. for the longest time. The landing craft did not have advocates, and that and that sh- ended up showing in the summer of 1944, is wh- whereas if they knew something like this was going to happen, you know, a year or two earlier, America with its industrial might, yeah, they could have pumped out 50,000 or whatever more landing craft, but it just wasn't getting the push that these other more offensive weapons, I guess, or, yeah. or I don't know if I'm saying that right, but, you know, it just, there was no one screaming landing craft for the last four years. Yeah, that, that that's definitely true. And and that's, you know, I think a lesson we can even look at today, right? That, right. You know, Eisenhower, you know, when you think about his famous speech as he left the presidency warning of the military industrial complex, you know, mm-hmm. people have interpreted that lots of different ways. But one of the, the key insights he had, you know, and, and that that speech is really about is, is his deep understanding of bureaucracy, right? Bureaucracy, right. bureaucracies, no matter what kind of bureaucracy it is, whether or not it's the post office or the United States Navy, are always going to seek to expand. They're going to have pet projects. Um, They're going to always seek to value themselves based on how much money and how many people they have. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, one of the things that he certainly saw from his position in the planning staff as early as 1942 is that the Navy loved their battleships uh, and their aircraft carriers, right? These big brassy uh, investments that you put really, you know, powerful names on like the, you know, the USS Hornet and uh, the USS independence. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, the air force loved just getting as many big bombers, um, you know, like the B 29, which kind of was a money pit, but they were fully invested in because it was at the bleeding edge of technology of the time. Right. Um, but when it came to just the practicality of, you know, how do you get from one place to another in a world that's covered with water? Um, you know, Eisenhower looked at it as like, we need lots of landing craft and, Landing craft were not lovable in any way. They're ugly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they're these. They look like trash barges if you actually <laughs> you know spend much time with looking well, at them. They don't even get proper names, right? It's like USS LST seven hundred three. Um, exactly. Right. They're, they're not. They're not loved. Yeah. Um, which makes it very hard in a bureaucracy for anyone to invest because if the Navy wants battleships and aircraft carriers and the Air Force wants. Um, you know, bombers and, and fighter jets and the, and the army wants their tanks. Yeah. Um, you have to have someone who's able to sit between all of those forces to say, no, 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 this is the thing we need for combined operations, right? Where we're integrating the Navy, the Air Force and the army all at the same time. Exactly. Um, and, and, and it was a struggle. It was really a struggle. The, the Navy, you know, was, try, you know, was very much against, they canceled a bunch of uh, LST, uh, not LST specifically, but landing craft building program in September of 1942. Mm. Um, in favor of some more battleships, and that ended up costing uh, the United States dearly. Um, ultimately, one of the heroes, the, some quiet heroes of the book, um, <laughs> is a guy named Brehan Somerville, uh, who was essentially the head of supply uh, for the War Department overall. And right. you know, eventually, he gets the reins and becomes just a, the taskmaster for getting everything built in the war, and does commit to the production of landing craft. He, you know, he's always competing against his own politics, but is right. is one of the few reasons why the United States is able to generate as many LSTs and LCAs and LCIs and all these other uh, landing crafts that we ultimately are able to deploy, uh, not only on the D-Day operations, but also obviously in the Pacific and in, in everywhere else. But yeah, it's, 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 I think to me, as you say, um, it was one of the you know, really nice, clear examples that was, easy, that was very familiar um, mm-hmm. Certainly, to anyone who's ever spent any time in the Defense Department, um, <laughs> you know, to understand, you know, how as much as things change, uh, a lot of things change the same. Uh, a lot of things stay the same, and uh, the fight over landing craft and what what we're going to dedicate our money to uh, is, is is certainly one of those. Exactly. I, I know this is hindsight, so I'm certainly not claiming, claiming any kind of wisdom. But when I was a teenager reading about World War II, I quickly picked up the idea that logistics isn't sexy, but it is necessary. So y- y- you do what you got to do. Um, yeah, I, and, and, I, and I would say, I, I think I might even say something like this in the book. That's why we won. Um, right. right? We, we didn't make the best planes. The German planes are way better yes. than ours. They, yes. te- they had jet technology way before we did. Um, we didn't even have the best guns. Germans and Brits made much better guns. We didn't have the most people. The Russians certainly had way more men than we did right. um, in the battlefield. Uh, our tanks, you know, 
five ten to one disadvantage against a Sherman or a Sherman tank was had a five to ten uh, to one disadvantage against a Panzer tank. Mm -hmm. Um, But we could get what we needed, where we needed it, when when we needed it. And that is, you know, in the dynamic sort of cauldron of battle. That's really what you need. You don't need the best stuff. You don't even need the most stuff. But you need what you need when you need it. And the United States, we that was that was really our that was our advantage in the Second World War uh, more than anything else. Exactly. If you can focus what power you have, that's more important than the amount of power you have. So yeah, they, the tip of the spear, I guess, if you will. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. We we just we just took that kind of stuff very seriously and and committed to it in ways that our our allies did not. Right, because people like Marshall and Eisenhower studied past battles, and they realized, yeah, th- this this are some of the things you have to do. So, the, again, this book focuses on the six months before D Day. We're getting close to D Day, and uh, as we've just discussed, Ike is solving problems here. He's solving problems there, or at least he keeps his options open. Again, a good political animal, if you will. But even Alan Brooke the chief of the British military staff, who is not nobody. This guy, this is a guy that Churchill listens to. Even he is starting to come around. And I'm quoting from your book, Alan Brooke wrote, Eisenhower was a swinger and no real director of thought, plans, energy, or direction, just a coordinator, a good mixer, a champion of interrelated cooperation. And in those respects, few can hold a candle to him. But is that enough? Or can we not find all the qualities of a commander in one man? And when I read that, first of all, I'm thinking, um, isn't that exactly what we need? We need someone who's a good, you know, coordinator, someone who he might not be a specialist in the air or the Navy or the Army, but he he knows how to bring these like, like we were just discussing a second ago. He knows how to bring these things and these people together to focus what power the allies have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I think, you know, that I, I, I included that line in the book because, you know, Alan Brooke almost looked almost lost no opportunity yes, <laughs> to slight yes, Eisenhower. Yes. <laughs> he never to liked his face. him. Yeah, to yeah. His face. He, he was always he was always looking to cut Eisenhower down. Um he just <laughs> He, you know, he, his, he didn't respect him. He didn't like him. Right. Um, he thought he was OK and he liked that he was you know good with the allies. But that was about as much as he would say yeah. um, in Eisenhower's favor. But I also thought that was, in a sense, almost more revealing of Alan Brooks short sightedness um, than Ooh, good point. it was of a criticism of Eisenhower in a way. Right. right. Because, you know, Alan Brooks is the one always accusing people of lacking vision. Like it's almost his go to insult with a yes. person. He just lacks vision. He lacks vision. Um, but what Alan Brooke sort of understood to be vision is, you know, kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning of this interview, uh, of, of this interview is, mm-hmm. you know, there's this, it's very easy to be charmed by charismatic individuals who are able to sort of rouse the blood and make you, you know, think grand thought, right. You to wit to this you know glorious place that they're causing you to imagine. And mm-hmm. Alan Brooke was kind of a sucker for that. And I think the British were right. They, they looked for leaders who, who sort of had that swashbuckling charisma. And yeah. as a consequence, weren't prepared for someone like Dwight Eisenhower, who, you know, was a football coach, right? He just described a football coach very well in that quote about Eisenhower um, right. and who could seem non-threatening. And at, by the same token, very quickly realized that their, their empire was not only going bankrupt, but that it was being supplanted around the world by, you know, a new American superpower that was advocating for democracy, human rights, and decolonization. And yeah. they kind of thought, you know, well, that's a naive, no one's going to buy this sort of naive sort of fairy talk. Um, but sure enough, they did, right? And the United Nations has it as a central plank, decolonization. Um, yeah. The, um, you know, democracy and human rights is now probably one of the organizing principles, it, it became very quickly one of the organizing principles of international law and international politics. And the British were caught up short because they had a very old world view of power um, oh, that yeah. they couldn't really fully reconcile themselves to. And I think Eisenhower is a great example of of uh, you know a very new kind of world um, that was that was burgeoning at this moment that the British just didn't see coming, um, and they almost thought it was impossible until obviously it was inevitable. And Ooh, I and, like and I think that quote from from Alan Brooke is very much um, emblematic of that kind of 
you know, I don't want to overstate it as a criticism sure. of Mel and Brooke or the British, but you know, I mean, certain they were very confident, right? This is we're we're still in the few years after the Victorian era has ended, right? These are right. these are these are men who grew up with the with Britain at the center of the world, and it was impossible to imagine anything else. And you know, seeing this sort of naive upstart of a world power, the United States, come along with a leader who, you know, wasn't trying to cast himself in marble uh, on every stage he stood right. is something that they just couldn't understand, right? That just didn't seem very powerful or threatening or competent to them. Um, yeah. But in reality, it was exactly what it took to get what needed done getting done. Exactly. Lessons are normally hard and painful, uh, painful, but that's that's why they're lessons. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to leave the rest of the book for the readers. I want them to to be able to enjoy the last couple of chapters on their own, even though they have a general sense of what's going on. Again, the pressure, the tension has not stopped. In the book, you talk about the pound, pound, pounding on uh, on Eisenhower. And in some ways, he did it to himself because he took this seriously. He wanted to get everything right. He wanted as few casualties as possible. So there was not any such thing as working too hard. And again, a very admirable quality. Um, but I wanted to ask you my last question. And again, for everybody, not only is this a good book, uh, and again, I normally only compliment myself, but this was well written. This was an absolute joy to read. And I, I want to thank you, sir. But what do you think Ike should be remembered for? Because every generation gets a crack at big events like World War II or big personalities like Ike from their own point of view. But how does kind of Ike stand up to the test of time? I, I think he's one of those people who gets better with time um, Ooh, because mm -hmm. he is the consummate leader. And, you know, I, maybe I've said this already, but I think, you know, he demonstrates what true leadership is is which is right. the ability not only to achieve a goal but to get the best out of those who are with you uh to achieving that goal to make things that were impossible and that would be impossible if any one person tried to do them themselves or singularly or with their own imagination um right. to make the impossible possible because it's the kind of thing that can only be done together um and to keep people together to maximize the amount of creativity energy force um, skills and talent that are available to a single common purpose. Um, the ability to to rally that, to muster it, and to point it all in the same direction is a very, I think, underrated skill because it doesn't yes. come with you know a lot of obvious hashtags or or <laughs> likes. Um, but it's right. what makes things like the D Day invasion, which very easily could have been a catastrophe, um, was predicted to be a catastrophe yes. uh, before it happened. Um, seem not only like a great victory, but something that obviously was always going to be a great victory. Um, right. And that really is the sign of a, you know, of a true leader who you know, deserves our respect, admiration. And I would also say study, because I think the world yes. would be a lot better if we had more political leaders who, who took the same approach to selfless service and, you know, focus on, you know, what is going to make the biggest difference in most people's lives um, and make that their focus as opposed to, you know, building up their clout. Um, and, mm. I, you know, I think the world, it's, I, I think our world would be a much better place. Certainly America would be a much better place if that was the kind of leadership that our, that our leaders modeled and that, you know, that our people rewarded um, at places like the ballot box. Right. I know well said because with, with Ike, I think talk less, do more and, you know, let, let your let your achievements, your success speak for you. So, Mr. Parody, thank you very much for this uh, for your time today. Thank you very much for this book. I think it's officially coming out June fourth, right before D Day, but obviously it can be pre ordered. I checked that on Amazon myself. Uh, and for everybody out there, it's the Light of Battle, Eisenhower, D Day, and the Birth of the American Superpower. Sir, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. And it was a really uh, great discussion, a lot of fun. And so thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me on again. Did you know that most vitamin D3 supplements come from sheep's wool? I'm Kat, founder of Ritual. We're making traceability the new standard for the supplement industry. When I was pregnant, I couldn't find a multivitamin I could trust, so I created my own. Ours is made traceable, third-party tested, and clean label project certified. 
Oh, and our vitamin D3? It comes from sustainably harvested lichen from England, not sheep. Trace for yourself with 25% off at ritual.com slash podcast.